are, we just finished our series core values and we are in our series break and this is a break of course because we're going to start another series uh, next coming week and we're going to continue with what we started last year because we did the book, every year we do a book study and we finished the book of um, I think uh, Philippians if I'm not mistaken, we did James and um, and uh, we do Old Testament, New Testament, and last year we did the Old Testament, which is the Book of Judges, and it's so long, of course, that's why we took about four months for the first half, and then we're gonna do another three months starting next week. So we're gonna start right after Jephthah. We're gonna be talking about Samson and Judges chapter 13. So again, this is a book study. We're gonna be thoroughly studying the, the scripture, because again, that's very important for us. It's good that we could look at the Old Testament and the New Testament and see how this, you know, the same God works and we're going we're gonna to continue. So the title, of course, is the Book of Judges, Faithful God. So what we could see as we study the Book of Judges is that the faithfulness of God through hundreds of years of people being unfaithful to Him. But today, it's serious break. I'll be praying. And the question is that over the five weeks, of the last five weeks, of course, we have articulated to you our core values, you know, what's important to us, what we are passionate about as a, you know, as every nation, as part of every nation, but also as part of our church, but I believe in the church, I believe in the spiritual community that God has placed all of us. Because again, if you look at the book, of course, the Bible is that God birthed the church in the book of Acts. So, but when this um, core values are lived out, it presents a challenge for all of us. Not only a challenge, I believe, but also an opportunity both a challenge and an opportunity. Because again, as you live it out with other people, then there is a challenge. When you live it out among the community that God placed you, there is also an opportunity. While practicing these values together can be our greatest strength, it can also be, it can also pose our greatest challenge. Great, greatest strength and our greatest challenge. As we live out, you know, starts with Lordship, Him being Lord of our lives. And then us accomplishing the mission that He has called us to go and make disciples, discipleship. And then you talk about evangelism, that we are called to preach the gospel, the good news to the world. And also leadership, that God called all of us to be leaders in our sphere of influence in which He had called us. And of course, that we will never sacrifice our family for ministry. When we live those out, our greatest strength. But also as we leave those out, it will be our greatest challenge as well. One of our greatest challenges. What am I trying to say here? So let me just put this on the screen for you because we're going to talk about unity today. And I believe that. Here's the first one. Unity is one of the greatest strengths of the church. Let me say that again. Unity is one of the greatest strengths of the church. There are many, but this is one of the greatest strengths of the church. So... Living this out after Jesus preaching, of course, you know, Matthew chapter 28, giving the greatest commission. So after that, of course, uh, all the four gospel talks about the great commission in their own ways. It's all about going out and preaching the gospel. But yet, when you jump to the book of Acts, this is where the church is birthed, right? So after that, they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. So here's what happened. Let me say this, we are not called to fulfill God's mission alone or in isolation. All of this that God had given us, the mission that God had given us, we are not called to do it alone. But yet in this culture, in a very individualistic culture, you know, it's all about me. It's all about myself. It's all about, I could do this on my own. But if you read the Bible, it's never about that. It's never about doing ministry alone. It's never about doing, fulfilling God's mission alone. But yet we live in a culture where there is highlighted about me, myself, and I. That I could do it myself. That I'm fine without other people. Yes, we may think that that is right, but actually it's not. Because we've been sold a lie that you are okay on your own. Actually, it's not true. Again, you look at the Bible, it's always about walking together with other people. The word, if you want to Google this or you want to do, go to a concordance, just look at the word another in the Bible, together in the Bible. There's a lot that we should walk together, that we should do things together, that we should bear each other's burden together. 
always together, always with one another, because Christian life is never meant to be lived alone. That's why unity is one of our greatest strengths. Look at the story in the book of, we don't have to go far. Remember Acts chapter 2 verse 44? Let me put that on the screen. And this is where after they were baptized by the Holy Spirit, the power of God was moving in the church. And here's the description of Luke as he writes. And all who believe were what? Yeah. Read that with me. And all who believe were? Yeah. And have all things in common. They are together. They're not isolated. It's not just one group is doing their own thing and another group is doing their own thing. No, no, no. They were all, all who believed, that was all believing the Lord Jesus Christ, were together. Together in doing what? Let's go back and start in verse 42. Let me present this to you. They were together what? And they devoted themselves to what? To the apostles' teaching. They were together studying God's word together. I like what Pastor Steve says, that we should do theology together. There's a danger when you start, start what? Studying the scripture on your own without anyone balancing that with you. I'm not saying that you don't study the scripture on your own, but please don't create another theology or a doctrine on your own. Together studying the scripture. There's something about sitting down with other people in a small group, life group, victory group, whatever you want it, you want to call that. There's something about sitting down with other people studying the scripture together. Right? You learn from the others. You get to feed off from the giftings that you could learn from other people. It's not how, how old you are in your walk with God. It never grows old. I'm turning 54 this year. I gave my life to the Lord when I was 18 years old. It's still a joy sitting down with people, studying the scripture together, no matter how old they are in their walk with God. I don't care if you're about a three month old, a month old in your walk with God, we could sit down and study the scripture together. Amen? There's a lot of weird people that study the scripture on their own. And they come up with this own theology that is not biblical because no one is correcting you. There's so much wealth in our church history that we need to go back to. Most of the things that we're learning today, they have processed this. Hundreds of years ago, believers that have walked with the Lord. As Solomon would say, there is nothing new under the sun. Together. They study the scripture together. I love that. Who are you studying the scripture together? In the internet, watching someone, in a YouTube. I'm not saying all of those are bad, but just be careful. With all the information available now, you have to look at the source. Source is very important. You know what? Maybe about well, okay, three months now. So me and my wife, we decided that we need to take care of our health. It's not that something wrong. So everything, so I do my annual physical exam. So everything is in the middle of all my blood works and everything by the, by the grace of God. But I felt like, okay, I need to, you know, shed some few weights. And uh, we started working out. It's interesting because when you look at YouTube about, you know, uh, exercises, just a lot. A lot. And one time we were switching one channel and I'm watching all of these people. I'm like, I need to make, just research who these people are. Because again, a lot of people would just post some things on YouTube. And there's one exercise that we're trying to follow that I figure out there's something wrong about this because the transition from one exercise to another is just too, too rough. So you were lying down, you would do this, and then after you would stand up and you like, I'm 54 years old. <laughs> because everybody could post something on YouTube. Everybody. So I decided that you know, we were doing this cardio. It's so funny because again, when we started about three months ago, and then we watched this cardio exercise. And I realized that, I told my wife, this, this, I think this is what I like for now. I'm not, because I, we, I did the first one that's like, we almost died. Like, and then we're gonna do this, and then we're gonna do that. Like, but this one, I said, I like this one, it's just, and then I watched the description, part cardio for seniors. <laughs> Beginner version, yeah, beginner seniors. And all they do is that. 
and say, I like that one. Instead of, burpees, jump, burpees. I'm like, ah. But I love doing exercise with my wife. We're doing it together. We love watching each other die together. Let me put it that way. So let's study the scripture together. Yes, study it in your own, but watch it off with other people. So I don't know. For some of you, you're missing a joy of sitting down with people, learning the scripture together, because your, your excuse is that you don't have time. Let's continue reading. And the fellowship, what is that? I love fellowship. That means they shared their lives together. Fellowship is that word in the scripture, shared lives. Or victory Christian fellowship is not church, it's just we fellowship, we share, uh, we share our lives together. Together. Somehow church is no longer like that. Church is a place where in you clock in, you clock out. No longer fellowship is happening. So for us, we have that church, hey, hello, I'm here. And then after that, hey, goodbye, see you. No fellowship. I like our church. We spend time fellowshiping. And to be honest, sometimes we are over fellowship. That's the thing. I have to break out the huddle so much because we love fellowshiping. And you know what? And the next one is that they breaking of bread. What is that? They did a communion together. Some would say eating. Yes, a breaking of bread. But communion is remembering what Christ has done. Imagine doing that with other people. It brings so much joy because there's something about doing things together and also praying together. Amen? How do you hear you pray? You pray, you know, alone. You pray alone, individually. Some of you, I know you pray before you eat. Right? You pray like, Lord, thank you. Amen. And after that, you're about to eat and then you ask, did we pray? Nothing, because you know what? You don't remember, because that's not from the heart. I've been guilty of that too. Don't worry, I'm telling you. We pray. Something about praying together. Something about me and my wife when we, at night, we pray for people at night. So in the morning, our prayer is praying for our personal, you know, walk, and, 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 and at night, that's when we start praying for other people. Praying together. There's something about praying together. There's something about holding hands. Only people that you like. Only if they do hand sanitizer, of course. Praying with other people. Hearing their prayer requests. Hearing them lift their prayers to the Lord. Something humbling about that. When you hear other people pray, something resonates in your heart. If you don't have those, you're missing something here. God I called us to do this together. Not alone. I'm not saying please don't pray alone. There's something about praying alone, but there's something about praying. Corporate prayer is powerful. You read the book of Acts. They were praying together. Place would shake, and there's almost like an earthquake because they're praying together. Wow. Amen? What was the result? Because they did that together. Look at this. And all came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. They were all in awe. Wonder in the book of, uh, in, in Greek is the word teras. Teras means what? Miracles that reveals a hidden truth. That's wonder. Miracles were happening and there's a truth being revealed. And another word is what? Signs are what? There are signposts. Semion in Greek. That means it is a signpost that directs you someone or to something. So when they were saying and all came upon every soul and many wonders, that means many what? Miracles that's been happening that's revealing who God is in their midst. And also signs and wonders, wonders were in a signpost that directs them to who God is. When we do things together we will experience signs and wonders from the Lord. something about doing things together. Oh, we have experienced a lot of signs and wonders in our church. Two of our church members diagnosed with cancer in Pasadena. Abdominal cancer is very specific. I'm not going to mention what, but you know what that is? Been diagnosed. Cyst. Diagnosed. This is a medically recorded miracle. 
After six months, we've been doing praying, fasting together, praying together. Went back to the doctor. The doctor says, I, I, I can't see. This is husband and wife who have been diagnosed with cancer. I cannot see the cyst anymore. They did check them for six months, run several tests. And then about a few months ago, they said, there's no more cancer. I don't know what happened, but there's no more cancer. Here's what the doctor says. God healed you. A non-Christian doctor saying, God healed you. Wonders, signs. That points to whom? That points to God. Doing things together. You may not believe in signs and wonders, but I've experienced so many of them in my lifetime. Not because of one individual people, person that has this. But the people, people in church, community, praying together for someone. Amen? Miracles of marriage being restored. Relationships. Miracles of salvation. All what points to a hidden truth. Which is what? The truth of who God is. To be honest with you, here's what I sense in my spirit. Let me share this to you. In this coming years, there's going to be a revival that's going to come into this nation. It's going to come through signs and wonders. Because the kids today, they have to see the real God through signs and wonders. And we're going to see more. Miracles and signs and wonders like we have never seen before. But it's not going to come through this man of God, you know, that comes down from the mountain. It's all going to come because we're going to come together as a spiritual community, praying for people. All of us are you excited about that yeah. together and look at this and we continue that was the result in short these signs and wonders are revealing and directing people to who God is and also look at this and there let's continue the things that they did together they were selling their possessions and belongings Wow that is a strong a lot of people says oh the church only wants your money um, okay Wants your money, we I want you to be generous. And they said that you know, generosity is not even in the Bible. Look at what happened in the early church. They were selling their possessions and belongings. They gave more. There was a study done. If you're gonna look at tithing in the New Testament, they said that the early church in the New Testament were giving about 30 to 40 percent, not 10. Some of you, you know, your jaw just dropped. But they were selling their possessions and belongings. They were selling their cars. They were selling their LV bags and Chloe bags and out of math. Some of you are having chills now. And distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Wow. So that's what. What do you mean by that? They practice generosity together. It's not an isolated case. The church, the people were generous together. Let's continue reading. And day by day, attending the temple together, that means they worship together. Let me encourage you, some of you, the service starts at 10.30. Come here before 10.30 because we want to worship with you together. Amen? Look at the person sitting right next to you. He's talking about you. We got used to that. We're trickling in in church. 10.30 or whatever church you attend. The service starts at 10.30 or 10. You're trickling at about 10.20. Come early. Because we want to worship together. Amen? 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 Amen. If it is an appointment that we go because we want to worship our king, you better be on time. But pastor, I'm busy. We are all busy. Hello. Amen. They worship together. Let's continue reading. Attending the temple the courts. Attending the temple together. And look at that. Breaking in their homes. Breaking bread. That means they eat together. Amen. So when we're eating... Don't isolate yourself. 
So when we're eating later, praise God, there's going to be a lot of food. It's Father's Day. Amen? So every day of the year is Mother's Day. <laughs> Only one day that is Father's Day. So this is our day today. By the way, they did an awesome job in that uh, phone photo booth there. Who did that? Unique. So great. Come on, let's give her a hand. That was beautiful. We're gonna ask all the food that we're gonna enjoy together. Don't isolate yourself. Eat with people. There's something about eating together that you have some conversations with people. Amen. Even if you don't want to talk, when you start eating, you can like we don't talk to you when you're eating. How can you notice? At least in our culture, that's what it is. They practice generosity together. They worship the Lord together. They ate together. They received their food with glad and generous heart. I love that. They received their food with glad and generous heart. They received the food. So when you receive the food, you should be joyful that you have something to eat. Not complaining. It's not like when you get the food. So this is all we have. This is where my dad's an offering goes. Mm. Only cookies. Trust me, there's more than cookies today. That's always been the trend in our church. And look at this. What was the result? Verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. The favor of God. Some translations would say the grace of God was evident in the church, in the early church. Why? Because they are doing things together. Not only that, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This was so radical in the early church that they did this. Because again, you have to understand that the history of the early church is that the church in, in that time, the, the period, is that people are so poor that they were just doing things on their own. Seldom did you see that people would sacrifice to help other people. It became something that people from the outside are watching the church and they said, something is different from this. I want to be a part of this. That's why people were at it. More people came because they were doing things together. And the grace, the favor of God, these are the manifestation of what the church can achieve if we do things together. The unity that God wants us to do. But also in the same breath, it posed one of the greatest challenge. And it was that while unity is one of our greatest strength, also is that this unity is one of our greatest, is one of the greatest threat to the church. Yeah. It's one of the greatest threat to the church. Let me share this to you. In a question and answer uh, celebration, Reformation 500 celebration, Dr. Sinclair Ferguson, a Scottish theologian in the Reformed circle, you can go with him if you want, was asked this question. What is the greatest threat to Christianity in this century? The question was, what is the greatest threat to Christianity in this century? And here's what he said. The church today is the greatest threat to really Christianity in the world. Don't, don't get me wrong. He, he is a theologian, a form theologian, loves, but here's what he said. Let me point to you why. Because the greatest threat to Christianity today comes from within the church, not without. Not from outside. Within, not from the outside. What do I mean by that? Satan is not the greatest threat. Whatever liberalism is out there is not the greatest threat. Wokeness is not the greatest threat. It could be a threat, but not one of those. But it's from within. And I believe it's because it's within it's because it's this unity. When we're not united, that's the greatest threat. I'm not primarily talking about here referring to this disagreement over core Christian doctrines, what defines Christianity, that could be a greatest threat as well. But I'll, let me boil it down more to something that it's more practical. I'm addressing the more prevalent disunity caused by everyday conflicts that fracture relationships in church. And what is that? Relational disunity. Now, 
doctrinal, yes, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. But relational disunity. The New Testament reveals that unity among Christians is far from easy. It's not. We are experiencing it now because the early church experienced it as well. In fact, a recurring struggle to all the churches that was planted. When you look at the Apostle Paul, he writes this letter to several churches. Let's look at the first one. It says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, he rebukes the Corinthians for their quarreling and divisions. You could read that, research that on your own. There's so much quarreling in the church. There's so many divisions that one would say, oh, I follow Paul, I follow Peter, I follow this certain group. And Paul was like, what is going on? So the church in Corinth is about personality. I follow certain personality, so it fractures the church. Galatians 5 verse 20 warns against what? Rivalries, dissensions, and divisions. Again, this is the churches in Galatia that Paul was writing. Also in Philippians, he urged two leaders, Judea and Sintich, to agree in the Lord according to him and pleads with others to intervene because there's two leaders fighting in the church that's affecting the church in Philippi. Relational disunity. Personality. People that we don't like. Preferences that somehow becomes now what we fight for and what we're going to stand for and die for. Preferences that doesn't mean anything. This is also Paul. Let me just continue reading. Colossians, you know, in, in chapter 3, he instructs the Colossians, forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you. Why? Because there's so much relational disunity in church. Paul was encouraging them, forgive one another as the Lord has forgiven you. Next, Ephesians, of course, exhorts the Ephesians not to indulge in corrupting talk, that means gossip, that are destroying the unity in church, so that not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God and put away all bitterness and wrath and anger and what? And clamor and slander along with all malice. Look at this. This is Paul writing to the church. And as if, if you read that, it seems like he's not writing to a church. Gossip, slander. Are you reading what I'm reading? That is the greatest threat. Well, I was reading this, this is just a small sample. There's a lot, I just cut it off because again, there's a lot that we could put in there. These are small samples of passages underscore how frequently Paul addresses the crucial issue of unity among believers. That's the challenge, folks. While we could do great things when we are united, also it could destroy us when we are not. Let me ask you this question. Why is relational unity in the church challenging? Why? Look at the person sitting right next to you. Come on, look, 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 it's okay. You look, smile, you know. Look like douche, you know, smile a bit. You know why? Because of that person. Yep, look up here. Look up here. Because of me. Because we're dealing with people. We're not dealing with chairs. People with emotions, people with preferences, people with differences. Come on now. Different background, different culture, different skin tone. I don't care. Because of the differences. And because of that, that's what happens. Hmm. There are countless of factors at play. But let me highlight a few, particularly within the spirit relational conflict. Alright? There's many that we could talk about. That we could do a series on that. But let me just highlight some few. There is some wise relational unity in the church challenging. Here's the first one. Let me put, there's some few, but let me highlight some three here, self-centeredness. What do you mean by that, Pastor? 
We think of ourselves as consumers instead of a spiritual community. You look at the church as a, you know, as a supermarket. You come in and you're like, oh, let me just go and see whatever I like. I like this, I like that. Mm -hmm. I don't like this, I don't like that. I don't like this person. It will be a challenge to walk and work together when members criticize themselves or members prioritize themselves, right? Self-centeredness is you. You prioritize you. Totally different of what the Lord had talked about us. And talked about and preached to, to, to us. And what is that? Not you being above, but others. It leads to problem when we view the church as a platform for expressing our gifts or accommodating our preferences. This is not what it is. This is not a platform. Yes, please express your gift, but we could express it in many different ways. But also it's not to accommodate your preferences. I've heard people, oh, I don't like music, I don't like the music. I don't like this and I don't like that. Okay, I understand that we have preferences, but the question that we need to ask has always been, is this the spiritual community where God is planting you? You have to establish that, because if that, the answer is yes, then you become a family. You just don't leave the family. It's because there's some preferences that you don't like. I was born in a Hearn family. We're eight and I'm the youngest. Trust me, there's some preferences in the family that I that I want my family to do. But it doesn't happen. But I don't abandon my family because of my preferences not being heard by my mom or by my other siblings. No! Because that's my family. Growing up, all I wanted to eat is fried chicken. I don't like vegetables. And you, all of you know that. So, But my mom would cook some vegetables. I don't have the choice because she she owns the home. She buys the food. You know what I would do? Because again, they were in the Philippines with my mom. So they would cut all of the small vegetables and, and they would put those little, you know, a little uh, pork that they would saute. And, and I would pick all of those small pork. <laughs> and put it on my plate. And from time to time, you know, you know, I have no choice, but I have to eat what's in there. Preference, no vegetable. But we have vegetables. So I'm going to walk out of that because of that preference. Sorry, this is not my family anymore because you don't like vegetables. Because you like vegetables. I'm walking away. No. The minute we feel uncomfortable when we are challenged, we leave. It's interesting because we have this phenomenon called, phenomenon called church hopping. I mean, I don't know if that's applicable in the New Testament. I mean, where would you go? It's the same church. I'm going to go to Antioch because Paul was there. And then he visits. I'm going to go to Jerusalem because Paul was there. It's that. Look at Philippians chapter 2 verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Imagine if we have that mindset that you consider people better than you, more significant than you. That means not self, but others. Others first before you. What a church we will have. Here's another factor that I wanted to share. Not only that, self-centeredness, but also relational unity is challenging hurt and offense. Emotional hurt is something we experience because something wrong has been done to us. You've been hurt. How many of you here, you've been hurt? Raise your hands. Yeah, me too. Not just you, me too. You've all been hurt. Let me ask you this question. How many of you in your family you've been hurt? Or did you leave? You sit down. You talk about it. You ask some people to intervene. So you've been hurt because some people lie about you, gossip about you, broken promises. We could name some few. I'm not saying if there's some 
physical hurt that you need to leave and then ask and look for a refuge, please do that if you're experiencing that in your family. Like physical abuse, constant physical abuse. If you're being abused, please seek help. But I'm talking about church, come on. You've been lied about, gossiped, talked about, promises that it's not being fulfilled. And to be honest to all of you here today, we will also, we have to also admit that there have been times when we have hurt people as well. Not only do you been hurt, you've hurt people as well. Come on, let's be honest. Right? Here's what I realized. Hurt happens to us. But offense is a choice. To be offended is a choice. When you got hurt, you have a choice. To be offended or not to be offended. The word for trap in the Greek is scandalo. Scandal is almost like that offense. It's a trap. When you got hurt, you have a choice. If you're going to bite into that bait for you to be trapped. Being offended is a choice made by us. Please, I'm not downplaying the hurt. I hope you hear what I'm saying here. I may not know the magnitude of the hurt, maybe the lie that was said about you. But this is also what it is. We have the choice not to be offended. We have to come to the Lord. That's why Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Bear. Have that margin to forgive. Why? Because you're dealing with people. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. How did the Lord forgive us? Unconditionally, of course. Amen? Also, here's what it is, but we must make a decision and agree not to quit or separate because of an offense. And here's the last one. Fear of confrontation. Why is this challenging? Relational unity in church is challenging because of what? Because of self-centeredness, hurt and offense, and fear of confrontation. And again, when you hear the word confrontation, of course, it's ding, 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 negative, but it's not. Here's what I wanted to say. Too many church members today, which is you and I, would rather sweep problems under the rug than deal with them. We don't want to talk about the problems. You've been offended, you've been hurt, but you don't want to call and sit down with people. Especially in our culture as Filipinos. We don't want those. We don't want confrontation, we don't want to, we don't want to talk about it, but we talk about, we talk about this with other people, but not with the person that you need to, to sit down and talk about. It. You will talk about it with your friends, you will talk about it with your family members, but yet the last person is the person that needs to hear is for you to be able to reconcile and bring healing into that situation. We don't discuss that with that person. What is our normal response? Just sweep it under the rug. We pretend that we don't have any because we're a culture that always smiles. But deep inside, you know there's something wrong. Hello. Let me share this to you. When we are afraid to speak the truth in love, it calls out sin and wrongdoing. It's going to destroy us. It's going to destroy us. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him, who is the head, into Christ. Speaking the truth in the confrontation is not negative. The only way that we're going to be able to grow together is when we speak the truth in love. Even though I love you, but you know what? There's something that you said, for example, that hurt me actually two weeks ago. 
and I just wanted to know you so that we could talk about this. We'd rather say that than pretend that everything is okay. And we laugh. Ha, 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 ha. But you know, that wound is there festering. Of course, it's there that one more offense, one more offense, and then you don't discuss and you just walk away. The drama, of course. Because you watch too many Korean novels. You watch, you binge so much on those Korean, Korean uh, shows that what happens is that you watch and everybody just, you know, and then after that, they just walk away and then someone is, you know, uh, uh, chasing after that person is walk, walking away. Come on, come on, we watch this thing. Let's reverse this whole thing, man. Let's sit down with people. Don't let people chase you. You chase them. Let's sit down. Let's talk about this. That's what we do. Me and my wife. When we have passionate discussions sometimes. We don't fight, we have passionate discussions. But we discuss that. The uncomfortable things that needed to be said. So that clarity and reconciliation could be achieved. Instead of pretending that everything is okay. Hello? Time will heal all wounds. Not emotions. Physical, yes. Because again, there's a process with you know, God heal everything, but emotional, no. They stay, they linger, and look up here, look up here, and they grow from an offense to bitterness. And that's dangerous right there. But we need to uproot those roots of bitterness. The thing about bitterness is this, it affects you. Your whole being, the people around you is affected when you're bitter. You can't control it, it's gonna come out. You could press it, you could suppress, sorry, suppress it if you want, but it's gonna come out. We could pretend, but people are gonna hear. People are gonna see the way you react with someone. talking to what? Having a fellowship in church, you're having a conversation and this person comes in and then suddenly your face change from smiling to and people ask you, bro, are you okay? Uh, you're actually, you're not okay. People could see but we pretend. It's like with my wife. Sometimes, you know, my wife looks at me and asks me, is there something wrong? Sometimes I pretend, no, it's okay. But she knows there's something wrong because we're not the same. Right? Sometimes we pretend it's okay. I'm okay. And here's what I've learned as we grow in our marriage is that if there's something wrong, I just tell her, yes, there's something wrong. But give me some time because I want to talk about this later. Give me an hour to process this. Give me three hours to process this. Give me till this afternoon to process this. And then after that, we're going to talk about it. Instead of, instead of pretending that there's nothing wrong. Because there's something wrong. Because when, when here's what we've learned. When we say there's nothing wrong, then we have to trust your word that there's nothing wrong. Right? Because when I say to her, there's nothing wrong. So she has to trust that word, there's nothing wrong. So she's going to live our you know, conversation or our fellowship as if there's nothing wrong. And then here you are getting mad at your spouse or someone is because, oh, you acting like that as if there's nothing, something's not wrong. Because you said that, nothing's wrong. Now you're mad. And that's what we decided. We're going to say that. Yeah, there's something wrong. We're processing it right now. But I want to talk about that, you know, maybe when we get home. Amen? Instead of pretending there's nothing wrong. Maybe there's nothing wrong, but you're acting on that. There's nothing wrong. You're not eating. There's nothing wrong. You're not happy to 
they say, it's like it's different. There's nothing wrong. I told you there's nothing wrong. <laughs> but it's so obvious that there's something wrong. Unity is a high call from God. A high and a hard call. It's one of our greatest strengths and also proposes one of our greatest challenges. Living the core values that God has given us is not going to be easy. That's why it's impossible apart from Christ. All of the things that we talked about is impossible apart from Christ. Why? Because the common denominator is Jesus Christ. That's why we have to start with Lordship. Lordship starts with acknowledging Him as the one who rules and reigns over our lives. Right? Impossible to do alone. Is marriage impossible without Christ? Relationships, marriage, friendship, impossible without Christ. Because if not, then it's going to be a disposable relationship. You just go change because you change that depending on how comfortable you are, not comfortable with the relationship, you don't want to pursue, you don't want to go deeper because the easiest way out is always to what? Let's start all over again with different people. But the problem is that you start with different people, it happens again. So you start with this friendship and it didn't work out because you didn't want to work it out. Then you move and says, I'm not going to talk to these people anymore. I'm going to go find another people in church. So now you start with these people. And then after that, you talk to Jason. And then after that, well, some situation, relational unity, you didn't. You know, I'm walking away slowly. Of course, they didn't know, but you're not going to text them anymore. You're not going to go to their gatherings anymore. Subtle way of saying, I don't want to be with you, but we're still in the same church. That's why I still wanted to be here. But since I don't want to be with you, I'm not going to be there. So I'm going to move here and then after that build relationship with another sets of people now you move and you move you don't settle and it happens over and over again hurt compounding offense growing to bitterness and now it destroys forgive us the Lord let's forgive us the common denominator is starting point is Jesus. So many times he told us the world will know that you are my disciples if you what? Love one another. Love one another. Forgive one another. Wow. To be honest with you, when you're hurt, you don't want to forgive. You don't want to forgive. Because you want to hold on to that pain to justify the wrong that has been done to you. But it's going to destroy you. It's going to destroy you. It's going to affect the people around you. We have to forgive as the Lord has forgiven. Is unity possible? Yes, because we've seen that in Acts chapter 2. Are there perfect people? No, they're not. But they have learned to put God at the center of everything and then second and God first. Is it possible to do that in our church? Of course. Is it going to be easy? Definitely not. You know why? To get a person sitting right next to you because of that person. Herb, you have no choice. Joan, you have no choice. Verdi, you have no choice. If we decide to walk together, we have also to make a decision that we're going to go through this even so it's difficult with God's help. Amen? Amen. Join me in the word prayer. God, thank you for your word today. Better together. Unity is possible because of you. The perfect example of is the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Perfect in unity. Lord, I pray that we would learn to forgive, that we would learn to put others first. And also teach us by your grace, Lord, to speak the truth in love. 
We can't do this on our own. That's why we're asking. We're asking for your grace. Heads bowed in peace and ask us. Let me just call in this one first. How many of you here are experiencing this unity in your household? And you're asking God, Lord, I pray for you today. Pray for healing in this relationship, Lord, with my immediate family and friends, maybe for some. We're asking God, Lord, heal this relationship. If that's your want you to lift up your hands, I pray for you. Yes, yes, yes. Lord, thank you. I pray for my brothers and sisters who are lifting up their hands. We're asking, Lord, come heal this relationship. We wanted you to be on the Lord. And we wanted to take heed your command or for us to be able to walk together, to walk in unity. Thank you, Lord. I pray for healing for each and family represented here. Families and friendship where it's been severed because of many things that we may not know at this moment, but yet when we pray for your healing. Thank you, God. Put down your hands. And also if you're here and you're saying, Lord, I'm committing, committing today to walk in unity in my spiritual community. Regardless of what happened, Lord, I'm going to walk with unity with others. I know it's going to be hard, Lord. I know it's going to be difficult. But thank you for your grace that is available. If that's your want you to live up your hands. Come on. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, 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 yes. Lord, thank you. Thank you, God, for the reminder. Thank you, Lord, for the joy. Like what Lara prayed this morning, Lord, that we started at the end of our worship, God, is that we are under your kingdom and your dominion. And as such, we submit to your will and not ours. Thank you, Lord, for each and every one. Put down your hands. We are on you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody says, Amen. 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 Amen